Uh, my name is Peggy Clark. Um, you guys are in for a huge treat. This is my favorite, favorite part of Spotlight Health. This is a really beautiful performance. Uh, it features the work of our Aspen New Voices fellows. Oh, here comes my other co-host. Come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. Okay, you guys, take a bow. Take a bow, there you go. Beautiful, take a bow. Can you say hello to everyone out there? Hello. Okay. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce uh, Courtney Martin and John Kerry, an amazing, beautiful friends of our tribe, and they have helped us with the undaunted performance for the last several years. Whoop, don't jump. Come back. <laughs> Many of the voice voices tonight will take you close to the edge, but not hopefully over the edge. But uh, I love John and Courtney very much. They are brilliant at what they do. They spend a lot of time working on TED, and they work, we're honored to have them working us with Aspen New Voices. So Courtney and John, take it away. Thank you. Hard acts to follow. Thank you, Peggy. So, an architect by training, John has expanded the practice of design for the public good. He has a new book on the dignifying power of design coming out this fall. He also happens to be my husband. I am a lucky guy. <laughs> uh, Courtney is a journalist obsessed with two things, storytelling and solutions. Uh, together we consult for TED, the Aspen Global Innovators Group, and other awesome collaborators. We live along with our two daughters in a co-housing community in Oakland, California. Now, we're here tonight because of the Aspen New Voices Fellowship, which some of you heard a little bit about earlier. It was established in 2013 with this incredible idea that the expert voices from the developing world were too often missing from discussions of global health and that we were all doing less well for it. So to date, there have been 80 fellows over five years 21 of which are here with us in Aspen this week. It's really amazing to have all of them here. <laughs> they collectively hail from 25 countries across Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, and notably have an equal male to female ratio. Which I love, as you can imagine. Um, all together, fellows have logged a staggering 2,500 media appearances. This is everything from the New York Times to CNN to the TED main stage to Moth main stage. They've been all over the place. Um, if you know someone who should be part of this group, and this is amazing global health leaders who you think have a voice that needs to be out in the world, nominations for 2018 open August 15th, and you just go to aspennewvoices.org and you can nominate people. So now, as many in, of you in this room know, improving global health and development is not for the weary. There are intractable systems and unpredictable conditions to contend with, birth, disease, death, and lots of heartbreak. It happens at such a massive scale. But the stories you are about to hear this evening remind us that many of the world's most promising interventions, uh, the world's most huge global health stars, are born in tiny moments, like a conversation between a professor and a student, or a mother's tender compliment. These frontline global health leaders are, in a sense, revealing the deeper reason for why they do what they do. So without further ado, let's jump in. Our first speaker is Neo Tapala, a medical doctor. The and mother policy. of the incredibly gorgeous children you just saw on the oh, stage, yes. by the way. <laughs> <clears throat> Neo is a medical doctor and policy expert from Botswana. Uh, what even her crew of fellows here may not know is that she was once the Southern Africa table tennis champion. <laughs> Woo! Is there anything this woman can't do? I will tell you one other little secret that you're about to, I, get, I guess, get straight from Neo, that she developed laryngitis today. So she is going to give it her all. Please join me in giving a big, warm wa round of applause to Neo. One of my favorite things to do is doing my daughter's hair. She's three years old. I believe you've already met her. <laughs> her name is Anile, which in Setswana means Blessings have poured upon us. Her middle name is Joy because of the sunshine she brings into my life, but also because I named her after the woman who raised me. 
my given mother, Joyce. Joyce wanted more children of her own, but she was having a hard time with it. So my birth mother, Joyce's closest sister, gave me to her. Joyce loved me, she nurtured me, she raised me as one of her own. I didn't call her my aunt, I called her my mother. We'd love to do the things that normally mothers and daughters do, and one of those things is doing hair. It was usually on Sunday afternoons, typically after a lazy morning at home or after a visit to church. I remember one particular Sunday afternoon, we were sitting in her bedroom, I was sitting on a stool and she was on the edge of her bed and she was combing out my hair. She mentioned very casually that I was lucky that I had healthy hair and I should take good care of it. I remember catching a glimpse of her face in the mirror. She was beautiful, she was wearing a wig. Underneath her wig, she had thin hair that had fallen off. I didn't think much of it at the time of what I saw. I remember just enjoying the warmth and the closeness of the two of us, and just what seemed like a really ordinary Sunday afternoon. A few months later, my mother died. She was 42. She had breast cancer, and I was 14. I was devastated. You know, there's a saying that says, children shouldn't die before their parents do. I felt that parents shouldn't die while their children are still children. I felt robbed. I felt uncertain. And I felt lost as a teenager and wondered how I'd go through adolescence and life without my best friend. There was something about the way my mother died as well that didn't feel right. I felt that the system had failed her, that something was missing. We were in Botswana and there was only one oncologist in the country at the time. And the treatment that she needed was not available in the country. So she had to make multiple weary trips to South Africa for treatment. But even then it was too late. She was diagnosed too late. So three years later, when I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go study in the US, it was with my mother in my heart that I resolved that I'd be a doctor and come back and help fill what was missing in the health system. I was lucky enough to make it into Harvard Medical School five years later. And throughout my medical training, the memory, the spirit of my mother kept coming back to me. I kept wondering how it must have been for her as a patient, losing her breast, losing her hair, whether she got enough counseling and support she needed to deal with the diagnosis, to talk to her children. I also got to know other patients who I learned so much from and surprised me in many ways. See, when I was in college in the early 2000s, HIV was the plague that was ravaging my country, Botswana. One third of the adult population was HIV positive and people were literally dropping like flies. So when I started doing rotations abroad to Botswana, to Rwanda, to Lesotho, to South Africa, I expected to see the same thing. But what I found was different. HIV patients were getting on medicines and living. The patients who were dying were like my patient Gelizo. Gelizo was 25, the same age I was at the time that I knew him. And in fact, we grew up in the same neighborhood and he went to the same public primary school. Gelizo was killed by high blood pressure and kidney failure. Losing Gelizo broke my heart. And it also angered me because I had patients in Boston with the exact same conditions, but they were living and treatments were available. So what people were dying from at home were diseases that nobody was talking about. People were dying from diabetes, from cancer, from asthma, from stroke, non-communicable diseases that today kill and account for more than two thirds of deaths today and diseases that are rising rapidly in Africa. I, I felt that nobody was talking about NCDs and it was the plague of my, of my day. So almost two decades later, I returned home to fulfill that long ago resolve to come back and help where the health system was missing. I didn't come back as an HIV specialist. I didn't come back as an oncologist. I came back as a mother. 
I came back as a woman who met one day kept breast cancer. I came back as a doctor and a health systems activist who believes that the public sector has a role in ensuring that people get care who need it. And an, an activist who believes that the system needs to confront um, the plague of the day. I do this through I do this through creating examples that help um, uh, prove the naysayers wrong and also help to elevate the expectations that people have for what Africa can do about NCDs. I do this through the conviction that limited resources does not mean no resources at all. Examples that I'm proud to have been a part of include Butaro Cancer Center of Excellence, which is in rural Rwanda, which has provided life-saving cancer treatment for now over 4,000 patients. Examples such as Botswana's first primary care guidelines, which will introduce breast cancer screening for women so that today women can have their cancers detected early and have a better chance than my mother to survive the disease. For me, breast cancer was a metaphor for any illness that can rob children of their mothers and mothers of their children and does so in a way that's unequal and unfair in the world. I do what I do for my mother I do what I do for my daughter, Anile, and I hope to one day live long enough to see her do her own daughter's hair. Thank you. Just stunning. Thank you, Neil. Our next speaker is Bernard Olayo, a doctor from Kenya who is probably more aware than most of us how the lack of oxygen up here at 8,000 feet is affecting us. <laughs> Bernard. Growing up in Western Kenya, I frequently fell ill with an illness that I later on learned I was malaria. Each time my mom took me to the hospital, the only thing I wanted was to sit on Dr. Luoch's swivel chair, an honor he never accorded me despite <laughs> multiple requests. <laughs> he insisted each time that to sit on that chair, I needed to study hard and become a doctor before he could let me sit on it. Two decades later, as a young doctor, I got my chance. I was posted to be the doctor for Suba District, which is on the shores of Lake Victoria in Western Kenya. Suba, for those who may not know, is one of the most beautiful parts of Kenya, rolling hills, just like Aspen, but also one of the most underserved regions of our country. The 250,000 people living there then were scattered around 17 islands in Lake Victoria with only one doctor to serve all their needs. So when I got this job, I took it as a challenge, an opportunity to live my dream, to be the doctor that I always wanted. So when I reported to my new station, there was some good news and also some bad news. And let me start with the bad news. The doctor's office in my new hospital did not have my dream chair. <laughs> yeah. But the work was great. The community appreciated it. I worked so hard and I enjoyed it. The midnight surgeries, the del deliveries in the dead of the night, I was living my dream. To be honest with all of you, those few years were the most joyous part of my career because I felt really successful. One Friday evening, at the end of a really long week, I was ready to take a break with my friends and to go out and have a drink and some meal. When I was called to go back to the hospital to review one last patient before I go away. So getting to the maternity uh, unit, 
I found a woman there. Her name was Emily. She was 22 years old, just about to get her first baby. And uh, when I did examine her, I realized that the baby was too big. So there's no way she was going to give birth normally. So I immediately decided that we're going to do a cesarean section and ordered my team to make arrangements so that we can do it. Walking into the OR a few minutes later, I was ready for another victory. And as we do it normally, I had a last minute chat with her before she could be put under anesthesia. And she asked me just one question. Doctor, will I come from this surgery alive? Of course I reassured her that it will be well. I had done more than 300 of such surgeries successfully, so there was no need for her to worry. With a signal from the head of the table, the anesthetist told me that we are ready to go. And as usual, I made my first incision and I immediately knew we were in deep trouble. Something had gone terribly wrong. The tube or the tubing that is supposed to give her oxygen, instead of going towards the lung, had gone towards the stomach and she was choking. So I immediately did what I had to do, which was to rush and get the baby out as the rest of the team tried to resuscitate Emily. Despite all our efforts, we were able to get the baby alive, but Emily died on the table. Facing the family who were in the waiting room just outside was really tough for me. You know, this is a young woman in good health with a very expectant husband looking forward to their first baby. And here we are, the mother had died on us. So walking into this room, I didn't know what to expect, but I explained to them that we did what we had to do, but unfortunately, the mother passed on. They were all in tears. The husband was crying, the rest of the relatives were crying, but they accepted her death as an act of God. Sometimes I wonder why this particular incident um, sticks with me. As a doctor working in the developing world, or even here, patients die when you're taking care of them. But this particular one was tough for me. So it taught me two things, that it is not just enough to have a good doctor. It's like landing a plane. So many things have to be right for you to be able to save lives. And that is why today I work on addressing these gaps in the health system that if they are not done correctly, we will not be able to save lives. I work on ensuring that we have oxygen at all the health facility and that we train our nurses to be able to administer anesthesia effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. That story, when he was rehearsing it a couple days ago, just absolutely gutted me. Um, and I'm still kind of gutted by it, actually. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, so, our next speaker is Jamila Headley. Uh, she's amazing. She's a health policy expert from Barbados. She's gonna give an incredible talk now, and you'll learn a little bit more about her after her talk. Thank you. Jamila. It was March 9th, 2007, and I was being rushed onto the tarmac and loaded into an air ambulance with my mom and two overly cheerful nurses. Now let's be clear, there was nothing to be cheerful about. Two weeks prior, I was walking on water and ev I had everything going for me. I had just traveled for six months in the Middle East. I'd just been awarded a Rhodes Scholarship. I'd finished college a semester early. 
and I'd finally gone home to Barbados, and I had one plan. I was going to be at the beach as much as possible. It was a beautiful day, and I was out surfing, and all of a sudden, I felt a strange and sharp cramp in my thighs. I paddled to the shore, sat down, and I couldn't get up again. I was rushed to the emergency room of the hospital. It was crammed full with patients, nurses, and doctors rushing to and fro. Um, I was placed in a hallway on a backboard on the floor, and the paramedics, as they walked away, looked apologetically. There were no beds at the hospital available. A nurse came by and injected something in my arm, I think something for the pain, something to keep me quiet, um, and I felt myself drifting away. When I woke up, I was still on the floor, and it was dark outside. I had no health insurance. My family had always lived hand to mouth. Um, I just hoped that maybe I had slipped a disc or something that wouldn't be too expensive. <laughs> Friends and family rallied together to raise the $2,500 that I needed for an MRI scan to diagnose me. One friend sold his personal computer. I hadn't slipped a disc or pinched a nerve. I'd suffered a sudden onset of a severe autoimmune condition called transverse myelitis, which had left me paralyzed from the waist down and unsure about whether I would ever walk again. In the days after uh, my diagnosis, I fielded calls from friends and family all over the world, um, including from Marilyn. Marilyn was the director of government relations at St. Michael's College, where I went to school. Now, the best way to describe Marilyn is that she is a class act. Her hair is always perfectly coiffed, her nails always perfectly manicured. She looks like she could be the top-ranking US diplomat. But yet, there's a sparkle in her eye, and there's always warmth in her face. And she earned the title of resident, mom in residence at, on college campus. So when Marilyn told me that I, had, that I should apply for the Rhodes Scholarship, even though I wasn't so sure I was interested in that, I did. And whenever I entered her office feeling a little bit low, I would leave feeling a few inches taller. When I got sick, Marilyn wanted to know everything. She said, what's happening? What's the problem? Well, I'd been struck by a severe autoimmune condition that no one knew what it was. What was the solution? Well, I needed more advanced medical care than I could get at home in Barbados. And even if I was to be in the 30% of people who have a good recovery from this, I would need months and months of intensive rehabilitation. So Marilyn got to work trying to figure out who had the power, who she knew who had power to get me what I needed. 10 days later, my family got a call from Marilyn. An air ambulance was coming to Barbados in three days. Um, to bring me to Fletcher Allen Hospital in Burlington, Vermont. Marilyn had spoken to the president of the college and gotten him to intervene with the hospital CEO um, to take me as a patient, no health insurance and all, and cover my health care costs. You know, I wouldn't be standing here today without Marilyn's intervention and the kind generosity of a uh, hospital CEO. Um, every morning I wake up and I stretch from head to toe and I'm so aware of how lucky I am to have gotten the care that I needed just then. Today, I work with a network of global activists who are working to make sure that all people living with HIV have affordable access to the treatment that they need. Around the world, there are 35 million people living with HIV or AIDS. HIV is not like transverse myelitis. It is neither rare nor difficult to treat, yet more than half of these people don't have access to the life-saving medicines they need. Much like Marilyn, as activists, we often don't have direct access to the power that we need to change this problem. But yet, we have a clear sense of what the problem is. We have sharp insight into the solutions, and our strategy always begins with, who has the power to make this change, and how do we move them? And so then, we get to work trying to influence those who hold power. We leverage the media, we target people close to decision makers, we make it a little more difficult for pharmaceutical companies who are charging exorbitant prices for drugs to do business as usual by holding the NASDAQ floor or blocking the streets of New York City or Durban, South Africa. We, we're, we are aware that we need to move power. Um, 
we don't intervene only with the resources that we have at our own disposal. We'd never have enough, just never have enough. We intervene to fundamentally change the distribution of resources and power so that we can scale access to life-saving services, not just for people that we know and love, but for millions of people we'll never meet. Each person living with HIV around the world who does not have access to treatment deserves a Marilyn. But each of these lives is far too important, far too consequential, and far too fragile to depend on the happy accident of knowing a Marilyn. We need a system rooted in justice that all 7.5 billion of us on this planet can depend on. One, where people can access healthcare regardless of who they are, where they live, how much money they have, what color their skin is. This is why I choose to be an activist. Thank you. So beautiful. She is fierce, right? I love that fierce buildup. It was just so beautiful. And even though Jamila still suffers a lot of physical consequences of having this autoimmune illness, you'll be glad to know she's headed straight from Aspen to Boulder, where she is going to be rock climbing her new obsession. So <laughs> you can't stop this woman, as you can tell. Our next speaker is Mercy Lungaho, a nutritionist from Kenya who at 5'11 is the shortest person in her very large family. Mercy. Growing up, I had the story of my birth many, many, many times. Sometimes, my mother would make me stand up in a room full of family and friends to tell the story. You see, my mother, when she was pregnant with me, had anemia. As a result, I was born too early. At 32 weeks, weighing barely two pounds, anemic myself, I was given 32, 72 hours to live. No doctor was willing to waste an incubator on a dying baby. So my mother paid double. She paid for the incubator and bribed the doctor to give me a fighting chance. She never let me forget it. <laughs> but every time I heard this story, it spoke to me. It said, Mercy, you have to make your life count. You have to make your mama proud. You have to have an impact in this life. In Africa, to make your mama proud, to have an impact, you have a choice of three careers. You can either be a doctor, an architect, or an engineer. Thankfully, I had grades for all three. So I thought, well, I'll go to medical school and make my mama proud. Well, nobody told me I wasn't cut out to be a doctor. <laughs> you see, when I watched sick children, they made me sick. When they threw up, I threw up. <laughs> so medical school sent me to my second choice, architecture. <laughs> Apparently, to be an architect, you must know how to draw. <laughs> I mean fine art. I had no clue what fine art was. I couldn't draw to save my life. So a very kind and loving professor sat me down, listened to my story, and said to me, move to nutrition it will serve you well. I didn't believe him. In that moment, he crushed my world. He broke my heart. My dream of making my mom proud was dead. What was nutrition? To me, it wasn't prestigious, but I needed the education. So I went on to get a PhD in nutrition. I took up a job in Rwanda, a nutrition research project. In this study, my job was to find out if eating a bean with more iron would resolve anemia in women. I had 200 girls, university students, aged 18 to 27. I had 135 days to get the evidence. It wasn't easy. I mean, this was a double-blind study. I had two types of beans, 
a high iron beam and a low iron beam, but they both looked exactly the same. Half my girls were taking the high iron beam and half the low iron beam, but none of us knew which group was assigned to which beam. So we couldn't cheat. We had to let the science work. This study had failed twice before. This was the beginning of my career as a scientist. It was a Hail Mary that I really needed to work. I'm not very patient, but I had to wait 135 days. Halfway into the study, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a beautiful evening. The sun was setting, we were setting up for dinner, and the girls were walking into the dining hall. From the side of my eye, I saw her. This young girl, she was usually very bubbly, but today she looked unhappy and she was whispering to her friends. I wanted in on this conversation. So I walked close to their table to eavesdrop. She was complaining to her friends about her monthly period, that it was regular, consistent, and on time. As a woman, I could empathize. She was moving from having irregular monthly periods to dealing with regularly the inconvenience, the distress, the cost of a monthly period. You see, when a woman has anemia, her brain tells her body, we don't have enough iron. You have to not waste any iron. So her periods become irregular. But when a woman has anemia and it is resolved, then her brain tells her body to resume the monthly period. In that moment, I got it. It was working. This was huge for my girls, for the world, for me. In Rwanda, we had found a solution for anemia. With this little bean, I had managed to stop the very thing that almost cost me my life. So well before we analyzed the data, published the paper, I had found out that this worked. It was a beautiful feeling. Finally, I'd made an impact. Finally, I could make my mama proud. Finally, I count. Oh, mercy. Amazing, amazing. And I, for one, as an architect, can tell you, I'm so glad you did not become an architect. <laughs> Next up, we have Dixon Chibanda, a psychiatrist from Zimbabwe. In addition to being a mental health expert, he's also a serious shoe aficionado. <laughs> Beyond that, Dixon had a little bit of a uh, rock star phase. I encourage you to search him on YouTube. Trust me, it's worth it. <laughs> Dixon, come on up. Young people are being killed by an epidemic that most of us are not aware of. Now, you might be thinking HIV, malaria, road traffic accidents, or even cancer? Well, it's none of these. See, the leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds globally is suicide. Yes, suicide. According to the World Health Organization, every 40 seconds, someone somewhere in the world is taking his or her life. And most of those deaths are occurring in low and middle income countries like my country. And the usual trigger is depression. But for a lot of these young people who are taking their lives, there are wider events that are associated with the depression, displacement, poverty, conflict, loss, isolation. The list is kind of endless, but the good thing is we can treat depression 
and we can avert the suicides. But we obviously don't have enough professionals in the world to do that. In my country, as you heard, there are only 12 psychiatrists, and I'm one of those 12. And in a lot of other countries in Africa, it's, it's pretty much the same. You know, you have a ratio of one psychiatrist to about one and a half million people. So it does sound kind of dismal, but let me put it into context to share with you part of my work. So one evening I get a call from the ER doctor or the emergency rooms doctor um, in a city called Mutare, which is some 200 miles away from where I live. And he's like, you know, one of your patients is here. Um, she took an overdose. Um, hemodynamically, she's fine. You know, her blood pressure and all her, her medical checks are fine, but we're not sure what to do with her, with her neuropsychiatric evaluation. And obviously, this is the middle of the night. I cannot be driving to Mutare. So we try as best as we could over the phone to try and do something, you know. So we come up with a plan, a strategy on how we're going to help Erica. Her name was Erica, 26 years old. And uh, the plan was, you know, when Erica is discharged from the hospital, she should then be brought to Harare, where I live. She should come with her mother. Three weeks down the line, I get a call from Erica's mother. And she says, well, a few days after Erica was discharged, she committed suicide. She hung herself from the mango tree. That broke my heart. It stunned me. Over the years, after experiencing numerous painful stories like Erica's, I began to soul search to try and find a solution. And all along, as a psychiatrist, I had thought people should come to me if they need help. And I realized that wasn't gonna work. I had to go to the people. And looking at the communities, I began to figure out what could really be done at community level. And we realized that the most stable reliable resource at the community level are grandmothers. And we're kind of thinking, is it possible to train grandmothers in, in CBT, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, something that takes a psychologist years and doctors have to, you know, spend so many years trying to figure out that. And so, in 2006, I started my first group of grandmothers who were trained in evidence-based talk therapy delivered on a park bench. There were 14. We now have more than 400 grandmothers who are trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, who are covering more than 70 communities. And in the last year alone, we've managed to assist more than 40,000 people. And most of those people presenting on the bench have suicidal ideation. And in our most recent publication in the Journal of the American Medical Association, we highlighted how after six months of receiving these services, people were still symptom-free and were not suicidal. Imagine if we could have a network of grandmothers, we call, it the, we call it the friendship bench in my country, a network of grandmothers in every major city that could reach out to people who were in need, to young people who were suicidal. I see no other appropriate way of remembering Erica and all the other people who have died or committed suicide, but to realize this dream would be an amazing way of remembering all these people. Thank you.
Do we have some grandmothers in the audience ready to sign up? I saw some nodding heads. I was like, that is a, a ready grandma. All right. Next up is Gulrez Shah Azar, a climate scientist from India. Now, Gulrez likes to joke that he's been institutionalized his whole life because he simply can't resist returning to school over and over and over again. So let's welcome this obscenely educated man to the stage. Hi, everyone. Hi. So being born in a lower middle class family in North India, I had really an unremarkable childhood. I remember endless school days punctuated by summer vacations, which I hated. <laughs> in school, while reading Ke Keats and Shelley, I always wondered, what's so poetic about a warm summer day? Yes, we had mangoes, but without electricity and fans for major part of the day, summer isn't a particularly enjoyable experience for billions in the developing world. It's infernally hot. <laughs> a scorching wind, it blows all day, and the sun, a giant flaming blowtorch, you know, <laughs> it sends, it throws fire. With continued visions of the fourth and the sixth circles of hell, we pray to Lord Almighty to deliver us from the heat now and for the hereafter. And really, li that's literally all we can do you know, during that summer. Because, you know, without a fan during the many power cuts, I remember the smell of kerosene, of being drenched in sweat, endlessly sitting and studying in front of a lantern, a candle or a gas lantern, uh, on, on the nights before exam because gas is expensive. So too close to the candle in my front here would kind of singe. And for some relief, we had hand fans. And you know, but they cannot be used while studying close to the candle because you know, they will blow off the flame. So we would carry buckets and spray the lukewarm water on the walls and floor to cool the house a bit. And taking turns, we still use the hand fans while we could. And we moved them till we were really tired and our hands hurt and exhausted, we would basically fall asleep but then wake up sweating and drenched in sweat, and then move the fan again before eventually collapsing again in exhaustion. And so this cycle repeats all night, every night, during power cuts, obviously. And when we were fortunate, and in a sense, we were fortunate to actually have a power connection at home. I mean, that's not the case for a, majority, a lot of people there in India. I mean, almost like 300 million people there actually do not have a power connection at home. And for context, I mean, that's the entire population of the US. So anyway, my father was, I mean, he would travel a lot when we were young, and with him, I would travel to you know places in India, villages. I mean, places I saw abject poverty, really, really poor people. And I mean, for somebody who was either poor or just a level above, that probably the only way to rise up was to you know to study really, really hard and you know have a career as was mentioned previously to you know become a doctor or an engineer or a civil servant. Then that was the only way. And so that's what I did. I studied really, really hard, and I ended up in med school. So I became a doctor and hopefully I would have a better future. Uh, in medical school, everybody wants to be a cardiac surgeon or a neurosurgeon. And so I didn't really know why, but I still wanted to do the same because everybody was doing it. <laughs> in the third year of medical school, I was sitting in this community medicine class. It was taught by a really you know, interesting professor. His name was Dr. Ali Amir, And he was talking about this power of prevention. He was a colorful personality. He was a student leader, a writer, and an excellent public speaker. And he was explaining how really simple interventions could be really effective in saving lives. He talked about ORS, a pinch of salt, a, sugar, a spoon of, water, of sugar, and a glass of water had saved almost 50 million lives. And that stuck me, 50 million. I mean, there was no way any, clinical, any, any clinician would ever be able to come close to that number. So it's, it's true, if you work in public health, no one would really come and say those cherished words, doctor, you saved my life. Yes, it's a thankless job. People only remember when prevention fails, but it saves millions of lives. And I came to understand the power of prevention that you know, health interventions don't have to be expensive or glamorous to be effective. So I took up public health as my calling. I was told I was throwing away my career. Doctors were supposed to be in scrubs, you know, doing surgeries, not work in villages. I spent the next three years there, spending a greater part of my time looking after sick in you know, villages, in slums, in mobile health clinics during my residency. And I did my dissertation along with the same professor. And things were going well. I got a scholarship uh, to study a public health program in Europe. And, but I, somewhere deep down, there was this still a hesitancy whether I was doing these things where, which, which I was doing OK. So I thought I'll maybe you know, ask my supervisor again. So gathering courage, I asked him the question. It was still bothering me. 
you know, I was brought up to escape this, my own social class, to aspire a certain kind of life, a safe life, a life full of, you know, stability and structure. So I asked him whether is it okay to like live a, like not live a structured life? <laughs> he was really sick at that time. And he asked me, like, how much structure do you really need in your life? The university where we studied, it had everything. It had, you know, its own security, its own gas station. It had its own grain yard. So he told me, I can tell you precisely where I will be buried. How much structure do you really want? So that was shocking. It was, I mean, that was true. Like, what was there to be so much afraid of? So for my first job, I moved to a city called Ahmedabad in India. And it's a city divided by social groups. Uh, the work was good, and my colleagues were really, really wonderful. When I arrived in Ahmedabad after a really uh, hot summer, and there was this terrible heat wave that had happened that year, 2010, which had killed many people. So I decided to study how and why heat kills people, like remembering my own childhood, and what can be done to protect poor people from such intolerable heat. So newspapers had reported few deaths. We counted thousands of death certificates, and those were probably underestimates, because if you're a migrant, homeless, poor, you probably don't have a death certificate issued for yourself. I surveyed slum communities, interviewed construction workers, Workers themselves were migrant and from other parts of the country. Their living conditions were beyond description. Women workers would carry their kids to work, and they were forced to you know, leave them away, leave them there on the, on the searing heat on the work sites. The work day there is nonstop. There are no restrooms or fans at the work sites. Uh, in the heat, the workers don't really they avoid wearing safety shoes, hats. They often hurt themselves, get into accidents. But as bad as the days are, the nights are even worse. Because with, with global warming, what we're seeing is that there is actually a bigger increase in minimum temperatures at night than the maximum temperatures in the day. So there's just no relief at, in those nights. I mean, workers being migrants, they sleep in makeshift shacks, which are covered with tin roofs, without fans, and the roofs still burning from the hot day. So our studies of this heat wave deaths in Ahmedabad taught us several things. Not only that who was dying and why, but what can be done to prevent heat wave deaths. And trust me, those numbers are huge. We're talking about tens of thousands of people dying everywhere, including in Europe and you know, Russia and all these countries. We've recorded heat wave deaths. And the measures are really simple. It's not just knowing that the heat wave poses a danger to health. That itself is protective. Simple measures like staying hydrated, temperature forecasting, hospital health services preparedness, these all save, save lives. So based on our work, the government of India is putting in place heat preparedness measures in several cities. And hopefully next time when a heat wave strikes, hopefully some lives would be spared. And so in that sense, I mean, this is the power of public health. To this day, I've never heard an individual actually come and patient come and tell me, doctor, you saved my life. But I know the work that my colleagues and I do, in fact, does save lives. If thousands, if not millions, definitely. And that's all the uh, you know, confirmation I need that I'm on the right path, structure or no structure. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much, Gores. I will never experience a hot day uh, quite the same way again. Um, now we have the pleasure from hearing from Bakari Sadibe, a global health expert from the Ivory Coast. Bakari, as you'll soon see, doesn't look like a traditional American Peace Corps volunteer, but that's exactly what he was. And he's gonna talk about how it determined the trajectory of his career. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Bakari. Hi, I think that, uh, yeah, you're right, because of uh, when I served as a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, people were very surprised because I had a really funny accent. I was not like everybody else. But I was one of the uh, few immigrants from Ivory Coast, uh, who actually I was really honored to serve as a Peace Corps volunteer. And uh, a small, tiny country called Ixtimo. Is it located in the south? Asia, between Indonesia and Australia. So I was working over there as, a, I was serving as a, a, a community health vol, uh, promotion volunteer. So I was really, uh, was successful. And then uh, 
I was doing community health uh, education in the communities, household, and the school. I even formed a youth group that was actually uh, doing uh, street drama to do health education. And then uh, they were also doing a talk show in their language, uh, uh, Timorese. And uh, everything was working well. I was well integrated in my community. I was so successful that a Peace Corps volunteer trainer in X Timor used my, me as a model to train other Peace Corps volunteers. So I was so connected to my family. When my uh, house mother had a uh, 12, they, said they had a their 12 baby, uh, 12, uh, 12 child, they decided to give my name to the baby. So when she delivered the baby, they brought the baby to me and I held the baby on my hand. He was wrapped up with a yellow sheet and he was sleeping. Smell good. <laughs> I automatically connected, immediately connected to him because he carried my name. I was honored. Three days later, I was in my room. My house mother came and she knocked my door. And I remember her voice. She called me. She said, Senor Bakari. And I responded. She said, Baby Bakari is sick. And I said, OK. So I walked to, to her and we walked. And then we went to where Baby Bakari was lying down. And he was wrapped also with sheep. I looked at his face. It was a color, like a purple color. And I wrapped the sheet around him, and the whole body was actually the same color. I knew at that time that my house mother came to call me. She was looking for a solution. I was the Peace Corps volunteer from America. I was a Peace Corps volunteer who was doing education, health education had the solution of a any health problem in the community. So uh, I was disespered. I wanted to receive baby Bakari uh, uh, life. So I call, I turn around and call my uh, house father. I said, let's take the baby to the hospital. And he look at me and say, Bakari, there's no way we can go to the hospital. And then I, I realized that at that point, the nearest hospital or clinic was like 20 miles away. It was 7 p.m. No car, no motorcycle, no doctor, no nurse. I was a disaster. I was like a complete loss. So I called my house uh, uh, grandmother, who actually helped to deliver the baby. She was not a medical doctor. She was not a nurse. But I was looking for a solution. I called her. She came. She looked at me, and she, was, she didn't know what to do. So I would, as we were looking for a solution, baby Bakari died around 10 PM. So I was a completely devastated. We, uh, I felt at that time that I let my community down. I let my house, uh, my house family down. Actually, let my myself down. So um, today, baby Bakari will be 20 years old. Sophomore student on his way going to be uh, one of the prominent leaders in East Timor. And then perhaps prominent leader in the world. Since his experience, that completely shifted my professional career. Working in a country, making sure that 
community health system become an integrated power of a health system, a health, health system of a limited resource country. And when I say community health system, I'm talking about working with the community using the human capacity, resource capacity, uh, natural resource capacity, financial capacity, and the social capacity. Those four Cs really empower the community to manage their own health. Thank you. I was gonna say, thank goodness John didn't come, have to come up here because he'd be crying and then I almost started crying again, okay. Thank you, Bakari, that was so heartfelt. Next up is Janet Medega, who is a research scientist originally from rural Kenya. We were walking over here together and I was asking her, so we asked all the fellows, kind of tell us some fun, curious fact about you that people might not know. And she said, oh, I love to cook. I'm a really good cook. I, my best dish is fried tilapia. And I said, okay, that's pretty good. And I said, now, as you're gonna hear, she's an, an insect scientist. I said, have you ever eaten an insect? She said, have I eaten an insect? She said, as a little girl, I knew exactly how to get to the ant hill, find the mother ant and fry the most protein-rich mother ant for a good meal. So if anyone needs that kind of tip, this is your woman. Please welcome Janet. Thank you. Um, growing up in a middle-class setting in Kenya, it was very easy to be content with the little that we had, and in fact, the world had its limits. And having a roof over our heads and a meal every day was just enough. We didn't need anything more. However, eight of us, my mother had eight children. We still managed to go through all the odds and were able to go to college on a government scholarship. At college, I studied biology and I quite enjoyed myself. In my final year of my biology degree, I got a chance to do a research project with a senior scientist, and her name was Lucy. Lucy was an insect um, specialist, and it was interesting for me because as a child growing up in a resource poor setting, I played with insects. In fact, my favorite were grasshoppers. I could collect them, preserve them in a jar, and sometimes feed them on grass. And those of us who grew up in Africa, I think a few of us can relate with this. So I went on to do my project with Lucy and I completed and got my degree. And just before I left on the last day, she asked me, so what are you gonna do after this? And I said, well, nothing, I'll go home and figure something out. Then she said, I have a job that you can do. So I said, okay, because and as an African child, you don't say no to opportunities. So the job was identifying insects. So she presented me with a jar full of beetles, ants, all collected from a field that needed identification. And to go with that was a very huge um, book, taxo a, ta a book of taxonomic keys for identifying any kind of insect. So I took on the job and I was identifying these insects, pinning them on a board and curating them for future reference because her interest was in insect biodiversity. So I quite enjoyed myself, did it for a few months, but one day I had my head down on the microscope, I was just finishing work and then I could tell she was standing behind me. But before I could turn and speak, she said, I think you can do better than this. And I looked at her in disbelief because I thought I was already doing so well on this job. But I was wrong because Lucy had a bigger picture for me. She said, I think you need to go for further education. You need to, you need to do a graduate degree. And I quickly thought, how was I gonna do that because my parents could not afford to pay for me. But she said, so I put that question to her and she said, there are scholarships and with your grades, I think you can get one. 
But then I wondered what it would mean for me to, to leave home as a fifth child out of eight. I would then be the first one to do that. So I was afraid. And I wondered what my parents would think because where I came from, it was known that when children left home to go abroad to study, they hardly ever came back. But it was also known that when they came back, they brought with them the riches of the world and made their families better. So I was ready to be that child and to take on this challenge and to take the opportunity and go away and study. So I applied for scholarships with her guidance and I got two. So I was on to a good, great start and um, I remember my parents coming to the city to see me off and it was difficult to part with them. They weren't sure whether I was gonna come back. I was going to be the first child to go away and I was frightened too. So I went on and did my degree in a master's in science and when it came to a point where I had to choose what to study, I chose insects. So only this time I thought about, I had very clear memories of always suffering from malaria as a child. And so medical entomology was one of the courses that were taught. So I chose to do medical entomology and I chose to specifically study mosquitoes. And I went on and completed that and everyone in my class thought I was crazy again because I chose to do um, mosquito karyotyping, identifying mosquito species based on their chromosomal banding patterns. But I quite enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of that again, um, it was time to go home and I thought I could see what to do next. And so I went on and did another, I, I, I went on and did a doctorate in entomology and I still studied mosquitoes. And so looking back from a child who played with insects for the lack of toys, to someone who has now taken up entomology as a career and uh, malaria entomology to be specific. This just shows us that the world is full of opportunities and is full of possibilities. And in fact, for those in the room who are familiar with the process of malaria control and malaria elimination, as an entomologist, I stand here today to say that even that malaria eradication based on mosquito control is possible. So let's go for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. You are absolutely amazing. Uh, next up, our penultimate speaker, second last speaker, we have Ngozi Irundu, an epidemiologist who has one foot in America, having grown up in St. Louis, and one foot in Nigeria, where her family is from, but her heart is in Hawaii, where she went to medical school and learned to become an expert surfer. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Irundu, excuse me, Nick, Nick Gozi. <laughs> So this one family of a lady who died from Ebola, they were particularly close to me. I remember walking with her brother and I would threaten to quit my job and move to his village of Korapar where I would sell very delicious bananas. And then he promised to find me a good and sensible husband because he was very distressed that at this age I still was not married. So it's interesting when you pull up the hood of different institutions and organizations and companies that relationships still matter and it's no different in global health. So if we go back six weeks before I arrived into Guinea, I had just completed my PhD um, in global health and epidemiology. And as soon as I finished, I started working for the Centers for Disease Control and I was deployed to Guinea to help with the outbreak response. But it was really the end of the outbreak. The outbreak had already been declared, so I was just going to train some of my local counterparts and um, help to build the surveillance system. So I was really dismayed and I was disappointed when we found that there were some new, um, new Ebola cases in the region where I was stationed. So Korapara, this, this village, is located in the southeast region of Guinea, and that's called the forest region. And this was the area that the entire West African outbreak started, really. So it was interesting to find myself there one day organizing with the community members. 
this community, were, they were phenomenal. They were amazing. When I think about them, I smile because they had lost so many of their own to Ebola, yet they were sitting with us international consultants and they were helping us to look for folks that may have been exposed to the virus and we were going to perform some contact tracing and monitoring together. But one day I realized that the same community that was helping me, these folks, they were exposed to, they could have been exposed to Ebola also. They, this was their community, they went to these the funerals of those who had died, they could have touched the bodies, and fear just slowly started to grip me. It's kind of, I had this aha moment, this realization of what situation I was actually in. But really quickly, as fast as the fear came, this feeling of triumph came as well, because that same community, just days before um, me and my colleagues came into to their village, they were threatening us. They were saying, we don't want you here, we don't trust you, we don't trust the government, um, if you put one foot into our village, then we'll kill you. And I, I believed them because they had delivered on that promise just two years before, at the beginning of the, of the outbreak, um, when they had killed nine local health uh, workers who were, was out there to help them, um, well, to inform them about Ebola. But I mean, this mistrust was merited, right? The international um, community had made a lot of mistakes in Ebola. There was a lot of heroic situations as well, heroic moments, but we had made a lot of mistakes. I remember one villager telling me that he felt that when we came in, we were erasing his people. As soon as they said that they had symptoms, we would take them somewhere far off, and many times people would never come back. And of course, it's probably because they died in the Ebola treatment unit. But at that time, we weren't really communicating this to people. We weren't allowing these villagers to see their loved ones, right? So by the time I came to Guinea, we had learned a lot of lessons, and so I benefited from a very informed and educated um, response team. When I got there, the villagers, they were integral to our, to our um, in outbreak investigation. They teamed up with us, they translated um, the information to the community members. Um, they, also, they also reassured people when they, when they were sick, they rode with them to the ETU, uh, the Ebola treatment units. Um, we also allowed people to see their family in the Ebola treatment unit, so it was just a very different situation. And this really, really helped the outbreak because before, when we weren't trusted, they were hiding their, their loved ones from us, and that extended the, the transmission chain. So, so one day when I went to the family that was so dear to me, and I saw the matriarch of the family, this older woman, and she was so lovely. She's the one who brought me all the bananas. I really liked her. <laughs> I saw that she was just losing some of her energy and looking a bit sick. And so I talked to her son and he said, okay, we'll keep an eye on her. And the next day I came back and her eyes were red and we decided, okay, I think she should go to the Ebola treatment unit for, treat, for treatment, for um, monitoring, so we could just make sure that everything is okay. So the family, they were, they were fine. They were like, okay, yes, you can take her, no problem. So a day later, she actually died. And and, and my, myself and my team, we had to go and tell the family about this. And, and this is when I realized that in those short few days, intense days, right, we had forged this strong bond, a real bond, because together we, we cried, together we prayed, together we mourned her, you know? And these types of bonds, they were important, like global health is complex, right? There's international coordination, there's vaccine de development and vaccine trials, but with, we could have all those things that if we don't have these relationships, then we're not going to get much done. And so because of this relationship with this family and multiplied across that region, we were able to stop this outbreak in 21 days. So. There's a lot of great lessons that I learned during that experience, but one that I didn't expect to learn was that it's actually easier to stop an outbreak than to find a husband. It's a rare woman that can mix humor with pandemics, am I right? That's not an easy one. Thank you, Ngozi. Love her. Okay, 
We're ending with a serious treat. Minda Dentler is an activist who was born in India and raised in Washington State. Now, many of you have probably seen the new blockbuster, Wonder Woman. I'm pretty convinced that the lead may have been miscast, and I think you will too after you hear this talk. This woman is the real deal. Please welcome Minda to the stage. She's gonna project, so listen up. I think, is it working? <laughs> it was October 11th, 2012, a day that I will never forget. I was on my bike, pushing up what seemed like a never-ending barren hill. And it wasn't just any hill. It was a 15-mile climb up to a town called Avi on the Hawaiian island of Kona. And it wasn't just any ride, it was at the Ironman World Championship. <laughs> I could still feel my muscles burning. I was struggling, tired, and dehydrated. It's like I could feel the heat emanating from the asphalt, measuring almost 98 degrees. I was near the halfway point of the bike portion of one of the most prestigious, longest single day endurance race events in the world. Every year during my childhood, I would watch this very race on TV with my dad on our 1970s style orange and brown sofa. And the Kona Ironman is like the Super Bowl of triathlon. And I remember being in utter awe watching these athletes push themselves to their limit in this grueling race. Now, just so you don't get the wrong idea, my family weren't just spectators. They were very athletic, and I always participated from the sidelines cheering on my three siblings or handing out water at local races. I remember wanting so badly to be able to compete, but I couldn't. By age 28, I was introduced to the sport of hand cycling and then triathlon. And then by luck, I met Jason Fowler, an Ironman world champion at a camp for athletes with disabilities. And like me, he competes in a wheelchair. And with his encouragement at age 34, I decided to go after Kona. So there I was putting it all out on the line. And when I finally reached the top of that 15 mile climb, I was discouraged. There was no way I was gonna make that swim bike cutoff time of 10 and a half hours because I was almost two hours off pace. I had to make the agonizing decision to quit. I removed my timing chip and I handed it over to a race official. My day was done. My best friend Shannon and my husband Sean they were waiting at the top of Pavi to drive me back to town, and on my way back to town, I began to cry. I had failed. My dream of completing the Ironman World Championship was crushed. I was embarrassed. I felt like I messed up. I worried about what my friends, my family, and people at work would think of me. What was I gonna put on Facebook? <laughs> How was I gonna explain to everyone that things didn't go the way I had assumed or planned? My first attempt ended in failure, but I knew that I had to put that failure behind me in order to move forward, and it wouldn't be the first time that I had faced insurmountable odds. I was born in Bombay, India, and just before my first birthday, I contracted polio, which left me paralyzed from the hips down. Unable to care for me, my birth mother left me at an orphanage. Fortunately, I was adopted by an American family, and I moved to Spokane, Washington, just shortly after my third birthday. And over the next few years, I underwent a series of surgeries on my hips, my legs, and my back that allowed me to walk with leg braces and crutches. As a child, I struggled with my disability. I felt like I didn't fit in. People stared at me all the time. I was self-conscious about wearing a back brace and leg braces, and I always hid my chicken legs under my pants. As a young girl, I thought thick, heavy braces on my legs did not look pretty or feminine. Among my generation, I'm one of the very few individuals in the US who are living with paralysis by polio today. Many people who contract polio in developing countries don't have access to the same uh, medical care, education, or opportunities like I have had in America. Many don't, do not even live to see adulthood. Thankfully, today, we are closer than ever to eliminating polio everywhere in the world. Since 1988, more than 2.5 billion children have been immunized against polio, and an estimated 16 million children 
who otherwise would have been paralyzed like me, are walking. Polio is preventable with a vaccine, but as a polio survivor, I can tell you that until it's eradicated, polio remains a very real threat, especially to children in the poorest communities of the world. Once every child is vaccinated, the polio virus will have nowhere to live. We can end it. We have to put our minds to it and overcome the odds. So on Saturday, October 12, 2013, one year and two days after my first attempt at Kona, I swam 2.4 miles, hand cycled 112 miles, and pushed a racing wheelchair, a marathon, or 26.2 miles, for a total distance of 140.6 miles with only the use of my arms. Across that finish line. And my final time was 14 hours and 39 minutes. For the first time in the 35 year history of the sport of Ironman, a female wheelchair athlete completed the Ironman World Championship. And it wasn't just any female athlete, it was me, a paralyzed orphan from India. After crossing that finish line, I was overwhelmed with joy and excitement. It was a storybook ending and the realization of a dream that seemed impossible to achieve. And finally, I realized that the journey itself was so much bigger than me. It represents what is possible. We all have the courage and resilience to succeed at whatever it is that motivates us. And that same determination that I've had for sports has driven me to become a fierce advocate for polio eradication. And if I can beat a 16 mile, 15 mile climb and an entire Ironman with only my arms, you better believe that together we can end polio once and for all. Linda, you are so extraordinary. If you can't picture what she achieved, let's have a look at this little image up here. Look at this woman. We're gonna welcome all the New Voices fellows, all of our incredible speakers up to the stage right now. Huge thanks to you all for being here. Um, special thanks to the extraordinary staff. I think Andrew Quinn, who is the program director, is going to come up and say a final few words. Well, you can tell I'm the luckiest guy in Aspen. I mean, the incredible honor it is to work with these amazing people uh, who have come and so far and give us so much wisdom and so much oomph. Uh, it really couldn't be any better. We do it with help from our friends at the Gates Foundation, also Open Society. I want to thank John and Courtney, who have been uh, just incredible thought partners through this whole process. <laughs> our friends at the Moth, two of whom are in the in the in the uh, audience here and who work with us over the course of the year, training folks on Moth stories. Rachel Strecker, who should be up here too. Um, who works, we're the two people who worked on staff uh, on, this pro on this project, and she does an incredible amount of work. Um, and Peggy Clark and our friends at Aspen Global Innovators. So thank you all for coming. Come meet these incredible people. They have tons more stories to sh share with you. And um, come back and see us next year. Thank you.